Tough loss over the weekend. Road trip comes to an end with a defeat. Despite a valiant comeback effort, Pitt couldn't get the job done at Miami. And we talked a lot about that on Saturday after the game. What we have to talk about now, what we need to be thinking about, what I think Pitt needs to be thinking about, is that the path forward is getting shorter and shorter. Which means they're running out of time to make their case and build their resume as an NCAA tournament team. What does Pitt need to do? What kind of challenges are they facing? And are there any bright spots we can look at and point at? Let's talk about it here on The Morning Pit. Let's get your week started on YouTube.com slash PantheLair.com. The weekends fly by, don't we? Don't they? <laughs> We're already back to Monday morning uh, here on YouTube.com slash PantheLair.com. Had an interesting weekend for sure. Watching the Pitt-Miami game on Saturday, the NFL games yesterday, college basketball throughout the weekend. And here we are at the beginning of another week with plenty to talk about. And you're in the right place to do just that. This is the Morning Pit. It's our daily talk show, our daily Pit talk show uh monday through friday every day of the week we get together here and talk a little bit about pit sports whatever's going on in the world of pit sports and we do it right here at youtube.com slash pantalaircom we also have our weekly live stream that we do every wednesday night at 8 p.m although this week i think is going to move to thursday night at 8 p.m but we'll uh keep you posted on that due to pit having a game on wednesday night uh, but we do a weekly live stream every every once a week, uh, me and Jim Hammett from Pantheler.com, we get together and hang out and talk to you about what's going on at Pitt Sports. We do post-game shows, live post-game shows after every road game. So we've got that going on as well. We were live after the Miami game on Saturday. It was a lot of fun. Kind of talk. I mean, you know, nobody enjoyed the outcome of the game, but it was fun to get together and talk about it for 45 minutes or an hour, something like that. So that was, uh, you know, that's something that we do here. And if you want to be a part of that, you can always just log in during, you know, turn on. Open the video while we're live, and you can get in the chat screen and post your comments and questions, and be part of the conversation. It's a lot of fun. We have a real, you know, back and forth. It's like it's like a call in show, except we can't hear your voice. We just read your your comments, your questions, and 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 talk about it. Uh, but it's it's fun. It's enjoyable. We do it, like I say, after every road game, not the home games, because the schedule doesn't exactly work out like that. Uh, we, we it it just the, the timing doesn't line up right. But after the road games, we are live. Um, right here at youtube.com slash pantheler.com and you can make sure you never miss any of it if you subscribe to our youtube channel because if you do that you can then turn on alerts and get a notification every time we go live whether it's a live stream on wednesday nights it's a post game show whatever it may be or new morning pit videos whatever we do here at youtube.com slash pantheler.com you can stay on top of it all by subscribing to the channel and of course we ask you to like this video and don't forget to head over and check out the website panther-lair.com pittsburgh.rivals.com for all of the pit sports news that you can handle. So, still a disappointing game on Saturday for Pitt. Uh, disappointing for how the Panthers played in the first 30 minutes. Disappointing that they were then able to turn it on in the final 10 and, po and you know, really build a, a valiant comeback effort. They had the lead down to two with 45 seconds left to play, uh, or, or 10 seconds as it were. Uh, well, I guess they had the lead down to two with 45 seconds left to play. They were able to get the ball back with 10 seconds to go. Couldn't exactly get the shot they wanted. Jalen Lowe, the ball was intended to be in his hands, and for good reason, as we'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, the ball was intended to be in Jalen Lowe's hands. He ends up trying to draw a foul. It, it becomes sort of the last-ditch effort, the, the last good option available. He's unable to draw the foul, even though clearly there was contact. Uh, and Miami ends up winning the game 72-68 after making a couple of free throws. You know, as we said on the post-game show, and we talked a lot on the post-game show about this, I mean, there's no moral victories. You're not going to walk out of it saying, well, you feel good about the team. It's too late in the season to feel good about the team. You can say, well, they played really hard in the final 10 minutes. They were down 19 with 10 minutes left to go, 60 to 41. And in a lot of situations, for a lot of teams, for a lot of pit teams, even those coached under, you know, by Jeff Cable, being down 19 with 10 minutes to go would be a death sentence. Being down 19, because they were even down 19 earlier than that, they were down 19 with 15 minutes to go or 14 and a half minutes to go. If that was the case, uh, plenty of teams that we've seen, and you've watched them just like I have, and, and you know we don't even need to name them, but we've seen plenty of teams that would have just you know cashed out at that point. And, and, and just mailed it in for the final 14 and a half minutes or the final 10 minutes, whatever the case may be. 
But this team didn't. And it is a credit to this team that they were willing to keep fighting, that they, they were resilient and they kept battling all the way down to the end. Um, that it took them until the final nine and a half or 10 minutes to actually put in that kind of effort and that kind of performance is uh, an indictment on the team, just as much as their performance in those final 10 minutes is a credit to them. Uh, they needed some of that earlier in the game. And, and yeah, it's good that they played the way they did coming down the stretch there. Um, I think in the final 932, Pitt shot 9 of 15 from the floor. So 60% from the floor. They were 5 of 10 from 3, 50% from 3. Uh, and, you know, which you compare those numbers to what they did in the previous 30 minutes and 28 seconds. Basically the entire game up until the final 932. The first 30 minutes and 28 seconds of the game on Saturday, they shot 30.6% from the floor. In the final nine and a half minutes, they shot 60%. So 30 to 60. They basically doubled their shooting percentage. And they did the same thing from three. From three, over the first 30 and a half minutes, they were 23.1%. In the final nine and a half minutes, they were 50%. So call it a, a switch flipped or whatever you want to say, all of a sudden they got good. And they started making shots. And Miami started missing a couple shots. And maybe some energy from offense carried over to defense. And, and they were able to play a little bit tougher defense on Miami. Although I think to some extent, I mean, I think Miami made some tough shots. I think Miami made some shots late in the clock. And, and a few of those weren't really a product of poor defense. I think there were plenty that were a product of poor defense. But a few of those weren't. And they were shots that were just sort of going down. And it feels like that happens a lot. <laughs> Happens against Pitt a lot. Maybe it's bad luck. Maybe it's bad defense. Probably it's a combination of both. A little bit of each. Um, but finally, in that final nine and a half minutes, Miami started missing a few of those late shot clock or just you know kind of poor shot selection shots. And Pitt started making baskets. They started getting buckets. The problem is, it was too it was too little at that point. It was too late at that point. And when you're talking about a game that is, you know, game number 20 of the season, posting a valiant comeback in the final nine and a half minutes of a game is also too little and too late, not just in terms of the game, but in terms of where this team is. You know, if you do that against, you know, in the Florida game or the Clemson game or something like that, you know, if you if you had found yourself in, in that situation against Florida or, or against Clemson, these games in November and December, if you had found yourself in, or I guess just December, if you had found yourself in that situation and, you know, being down 19 with 10 minutes to play and you battled back and made it a two point game in the final minute only to lose just, you know, you know, on what should have been a, a foul that was called a game that should have been gone going to overtime. Then then you say, OK, this is this is good. This is something to build from. This is something positive. But it's not game eight or thirteen or you know ten or something like that. This is game twenty. You know, you, there's eleven games left in the regular season. You are two thirds of the way through the season, which is well past the expiration date for. Again, I, I don't want to use the term, but it's sort of the easiest shorthand that we have: moral victories. We're well past the point of of accepting those and needing those and taking much solace or encouragement from them. There are individual performances we can point to here and say, well, this is encouraging going forward. Uh, the, the overall trend, I mean, the, the ability to fight back in that situation, sure. You say, wow, that speaks well of those guys. But you don't need encouragement right now. You don't need solace or consolation. You need wins. And as you know, when the end of the season comes, and we're looking back on where Pitt fell short and what ultimately caused them to miss the NCAA tournament, we're going to look at games like that. Games like Saturday, where we say, hmm, boy, if they had played, you know, if you took the final nine and a half minutes and they played like that for just a couple more minutes, at some point in that game, they'd probably win and get a big quad one win on the road. You know, and, you, and you're going to look back and you say, boy, if they just hit some free throws against Syracuse on the road, that's another good win. And boy, they blew that other Syracuse game. And boy, they blew that Missouri game. The list of missed opportunities for this team will be a lengthy one to consider. And the problem now, and it's been the problem for a, a week or two, but it's true, it's really the problem now. And the point was hammered home when they weren't able to complete the three game road trip with three wins. They end up going two and one on the road. 
uh, with the wins at Duke and Georgia Tech, obviously being good wins, uh, but failing to sort of complete the trifecta there. The problem now is that you're running out of opportunities. You're running out of opportunities. They're 12 and 8 right now uh, with 11 games to play. So that means even hitting the 20 win mark, which we, we sort of hold up there as, you know, maybe, maybe not a, a, a benchmark for NCAA tournament qualification or, or eligibility or whatever you would call it. And that's not a hard and fast rule. And it's, it's, you know, less solid than ever. But even to do that now, you have to go eight and three in the final 11. And if this team is still prone to the kind of issues that dogged them on Saturday, it's real hard to pick them to go eight and three over an 11 game stretch against conference competition. Feels pretty unlikely, as a matter of fact. Because no matter what encouraging signs we see, and, and we see, I mean, there are plenty, and we're going to talk about it in a second. I, I, I've got some encouraging things. This isn't just going to be all a, a, a bummer episode. Uh, but no matter what encouraging signs we see, the fact that these issues and these problems and these struggles still are still cropping up in game 20, that they haven't fully moved past these or moved past them enough that they can, they only happen in spurts that can be overcome uh, in the course of a victory. The fact that that still happens means that this team is still going to be prone to inconsistency and, and sporadic struggles as well as sporadic success. And sometimes that sporadic success will sustain just long enough to win a game like they won at Duke. You know, sometimes that sporadic success will be enough to help them manufacture and complete a comeback like they did at Georgia Tech. In this game on Saturday, the sporadic success was sustained long enough to get them almost there, but they couldn't finish the deal. And you go forward saying, well, I wonder if they'll be able to stretch enough sporadic success together to get this win or that win. When you look over the rest of the schedule, there's there are opportunities out there, but they're dwindling. NC State, for example, is down to number, as of yesterday, uh, the, when I looked, NC State was down to number 77 in the, the net rankings, which makes the away game, uh, you know, what, three games from now, a quad two game, as opposed to when they were inside the top 75, it was a quad one game. Uh, you know, similarly, that moves the home game, the regular season finale, if NC State's still 77 at that point, to a quad three game. You lost an opportunity there. And when you go down the rest of the schedule in these 11 games, there's currently, again, as of yesterday, the, the rankings may have updated or the net rankings may have changed by now, but uh, there are three, three quad one games left on the schedule at Virginia, at Wake Forest and at Clemson. Handful of quad two games, this Wake Forest game on Wednesday night, NC State on the road, uh, Virginia Tech at home, and then Boston College on the road. You got a quad, a two quad four games with Notre Dame and Louisville both at home, and then a couple of quad three games to end the season, Florida State at home and NC State at home. And again, these numbers change. These things can always shift, and they, they do, and they will. Um, a little bit here, a little bit there. I mean, like you said, that NC State – you know, being at number 77, if the, you know, if NC State could like recapture a little of whatever it had like a week ago before they went on this losing streak, uh, they, you know, they could, they could easily climb back in that top 75. And then that road game becomes a quad one game. I mean, like there, there are going to be opportunities out there, but my point is this with just 11 games left, those opportunities are dwindling. The time is running out to the point where, I mean, we have to spend equal time talking about Pitt's NIT chances as we do talking about Pitt's NCAA tournament chances because it's feeling less and less likely that the big dance is going to be where Pitt is spending its postseason. Now, they can still win a bunch of these games. They can still win a game or two in the NCAA tournament and and maybe make the NIT or something like that and, and end up with 20, 21, 22 wins and, and have a decent season that you can ideally build from depending on who you bring back for next year. But it's going to be really hard to shake the feeling of the missed opportunities. The two Syracuse games, the Missouri game, this Miami game. And never mind getting into something like the North Carolina game where they had an opportunity early on to maybe uh, really create some distance between themselves in North Carolina and they just couldn't make any shots. Carolina couldn't make any shots, but neither could Pitt. Uh, or at least not enough to, to create some separation there. It just feels like time is running out for this team. And... They're, they they just can't keep wasting these opportunities. Now, 
in terms of encouragement, look, there's nothing better than Jalen Lowe right now. I, I mean, really, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up getting another ACC uh, Rookie of the Week honors. Um, you know, you go Tuesday at Georgia Tech, he had 12 points, 4 of 9 shooting, 2 of 5 from 3. And then, of course, the Miami game, he had 17 points, 6 of 13 shooting, 2 of 7 from 3. He was um, really good in that final 9.5 minutes. He scored 13 points. He was 4 of 5 from the field and made three, uh, 3 out of 4 free throws. Um, You know, to finish with 17 in that game. I mean, he was just outstanding. Jalen Lowe, uh, over the last four games, so the Syracuse game at home and then this three-game road trip to Duke, Georgia Tech, and Miami. Jalen Lowe, in these three games, is average. the last three games, is averaging 16.5 points per game. Or excuse me, the last four games. Is averaging 16.5 points per game. He's shooting 45.3% from the field, 36.8% from three. 73% from the free throw line. Needs to get a little better there. He's 11 of 15. He's averaging 3.3 3. 3 rebounds per game. Here's a great number. In the last four games, Jalen Lowe is averaging four assists and one turnover per game. Four to one. That's not an exaggeration. He has 16 assists in the last four games and only four turnovers. Those are great numbers for Jalen Lowe. And if you really, if you, I keep, you know, I think last week when I was talking about lows, we talked about stats and what's he, what he's done over this game, this stretch or that stretch, this many games, that many games. If you just go back to that first Syracuse game, which is really where the conference schedule started. I mean, ignore that one-off orphan Clemson game. Um, you know, you go back to December 30th when they played at Syracuse and it's what, eight games, eight conference games since then. Uh, over those eight games, Jalen Lowe is shooting. He's a, he's averaging twelve point nine points per game, thirteen points per game. He's shooting forty three point six percent from the field, thirty nine percent from three. Uh, he's averaging three rebounds, three point four assists, and one point four turnovers. So he's been really hot in the last four games. But really, this is a, a a a stretch of strong play that dates back to the beginning of conference the the conference schedule. Jalen Lowe has been really good. He's just turned it up in these last four when he scored 20, 17, 12, and 17. I mean, he has been dynamite. And, you know, I'm going to heap a ton of praise on Jalen Lowe. He scored 13 points in the final nine and a half minutes of the game on Saturday. He finished with 17. So in the first 30 minutes of the game, he only had four points. And that was as much of a problem as anything. His play early in the game, Bub Carrington's play early, I mean, really kind of throughout, but especially early in the game, those guys weren't having the impact that they needed to have particularly coming off of that game at Georgia Tech where the guards keyed the win, where Jalen Lowe, Bub Carrington, Ishmael Leggett were the, the leaders in that game. They led Pitt to victory at Georgia Tech. And so I expected them to come out and have the same kind of impact right off the bat at Miami, and they didn't. They really didn't have that impact until, like I say, Lowe kind of uh, really started producing in the final nine and a half minutes. And so I'll heap praise on Jalen Lowe, but I'll also say, Dude, don't wait till the final 10 minutes to start doing something. Blake Henson, uh, good game at uh at at Miami, ended up with 21 points, a game high 21. I, I thought he played well. I you know, he didn't do much in that final stretch. We talked about that final nine and a half minutes. Henson was two of five from the floor for just five points. Uh, but he was better, you know, he was six of fourteen in the 30 minutes leading up to that. Uh, but really, I think we're seeing Henson play better over these last three games. These last three games, this road trip, Henson's averaging 18 points per game. He's shooting 51.4% from the field, 52.2% from three, and averaging 7.7 rebounds per game. So he's averaging 18 and eight, and he's shooting over 50% from the floor and from three. Blake Henson's feeling it. Uh, I, I, and, and it's, you know, the Georgia tech game was a little quiet. He was obviously outstanding at Duke. Uh, he got lots of, he scored, you know, into, got into the twenties for, I think the eighth or ninth time this season with the Miami game. He's, I, I think he's rounding into the, into form you know, we'll see if he can carry it over to playing at home. Uh, cause it is interesting that he had this hot streak, you know, all those numbers I just gave you are him playing over the last three games all on the road. But I think Blake Henson is, is finding his groove and they need him in his groove as much as they need anything heading into February. They need Blake Henson 
playing well. They need Jalen Lowe to continue to, to ascend. And they need Bub Carrington to find his, his role. Bub Carrington and Ishmael Leggett are key players for this team, but they've got to be doing the things that Pitt needs them to do. And I'm not saying they're they're trying to do other things, but I think they need to understand how they can help this team the most. Now, that's not to say that they need to take a back seat. I am not suggesting Bub Carrington takes a back seat. Bub Carrington should be a leading scorer for this team, one out of every three nights. Really. Um, but he's got to find the way to do that. There's there's a balance and a sweet spot between the three-point shooting, the pull-up Jays, and, and just driving to the basket. Somebody said on the, the message boards, uh, our good friend DT Pitt said on the message boards that you know Bub is, is just not that player who's going to drive in and, and aggressively attack the rim. I, I haven't given up on the notion just yet, personally, me, um, but he's going to have to do it. You know, and I, I don't know if it, it's just not something he's comfortable with or if he's making business decisions, whatever it may be. He needs, I, I think that's got to be part of his game. He needs to be a three level scorer. And, and right now, I think, I mean, he's got the potential to be effective at two levels, but I think adding that extra element of being able to go to the rim, he's fast enough, he's athletic enough, he's got the bounce to do it, he can finish there. He's just got to go there so that. There's no safe way to guard him. That if you guard him to try and prevent against the three, he can drive in for you know all the way to the hoop. You know if you if you play him to drive, then he can pull up for the mid range. You know if you lay off and you're you're just waiting for him to try to attack, he can he can pull up and and shoot from outside. He's capable of doing all three of those things. He needs to do all three of those things. Because even though time is running out, like I said, on this season. Uh, and Pitt's NCAA tournament resume, we're still going to talk about the things that they can do better and can do well and need to do better and need to do well to try to have a chance to to build that thing up. They'll get their next chance on Wednesday night against Wake Forest. We'll have lots of coverage for you heading into that game, of course. We'll have morning Pitt videos all day, uh, you know, not all day, but all week, uh, and then we'll have our live Panther show on Thursday night to talk about the game and recap it. So make sure you uh, like this video and subscribe, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. Head over to the website for all the Pitt football, basketball, and recruiting coverage, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com, to get all of your Pitt sports news. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I appreciate it. I hope you had a great weekend and enjoyed uh, everything that you did. Uh, and I hope your Monday gets off to a great start. We're almost to the end of January. And we're hurtling toward February. All and, uh, you know, whatever happens with Pitt, we'll be talking about it right here on youtube.com slash